There was headline news from eastern Ukraine this past week, the region known as Donbass, when a Dutch-led multinational team of investigators concluded that Russian-built missiles were used to shoot down that Malaysia Airlines plane two years ago, killing almost 300 people. The aircraft was brought down about six months after the revolution centered in Kiev that ousted the former pro-Moscow president, Viktor Yanukovych, and the media war there has been ongoing ever since. Twice this year, a pro-Kiev website called Mirotvorets has leaked online the personal data of thousands of journalists who applied for accreditation to cover the fighting in the East. The justification offered by the site that many journalists have been collaborating with separatist pro-Russian forces there. Many Ukrainians in both East and West do see journalists as participants, even foot soldiers, in the conflict over Donbass. The challenge for reporters and news consumers is navigating through the confusion and misinformation while still upholding freedom of the press. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on Ukraine and the dangers of the information war with Russia. For the last two years, the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine has been at war. The fighting is between the Petro Poroshenko government in Kiev and pro-Russia separatists who say that they want autonomy from Ukraine. The separatists declared independence in April 2014, creating the Donetsk People's Republic, or DNR, and Luhansk People's Republic, LNR. Both have been designated as terrorist organizations by Kiev, which also says that the territories have been illegally occupied by Russian forces that are supporting the separatists. For journalists wanting to cover the fighting in eastern Ukraine, landing at checkpoints like this one is almost a certainty. The only way to get through is with accreditation, not issued by the government in Kiev, but by the separatists in Donbass. It's completely clear why the authorities of DNR introduced this accreditation process. It's not so much to control and regulate the number of journalists coming into the region, but rather to understand who these people are and whether any of them would be inconvenient to have around or as secret agents. The issue is if you don't have any, any, any sort of accreditation at all, you stand a much bigger risk of being arrested and being held somewhere and being accused of being a spy. Now, journalists who are writing critical pieces at this point aren't being let in, and that really ba biases a lot of the coverage. In May, a website run by pro-Kiev activists, Mirot Forets, or Peacekeeper, began releasing personal information belonging to more than 5,000 journalists who had applied for accreditation in Donbass. The leak is being called The Dump, and the data was reportedly hacked from the inbox of a separatist administrator. It reveals how journalists were categorized during the accreditation process. Those deemed to be critical of the DNR, LNR and Russia were marked red. Yellow was for those considered suspect, friendly journalists were in green and white was for neutrals. Journalists in the green and white category typically got accredited. Journalists in red and yellow usually did not. However, when Mirat Foritz leaked the data, it said that all the journalists who had applied for accreditation were collaborating with terrorists. The list included uh, Ukrainian journalists that were trying to do their job fairly and Western journalists um, that were a major asset actually in exposing Russia's role in the war in Donbass. Uh, we should uh, recall at least Simon Ostrowski's selfie soldiers when he traced uh, social media posts of Russian soldiers by taking photos of the positions where, where they took them. So we headed to Ukraine to see if we could find the place it was taken. And basically traced a soldier, a Russian soldier's path into Donbass. I was on that list because I'd gone to cover MH17 after the crash had happened. And what was really dangerous is that Mirot Voritz wrote and accused journalists of being terrorist uh, accomplices, of aiding terrorists. And when they published this information, they said, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, we're saying these people are terrorist accomplices. We're putting their contact information out there, but we're leaving it up to you to take action. And the problem with that is it enc encourages a kind of vigilantism. <laughs> The main goal of Merot Vorets is to create a situation where there are no independent journalists in Ukraine. They say a journalist should be patriotic towards their country, so they shouldn't speak about corruption or crimes committed by the government. 
or if it has something to do with the war, and the information can strengthen the enemy's hand in the conflict, then that should not be reported. And this is a huge danger for journalists. Katya Seretskova, a journalist working for the Kiev-based news outlet Khomatsky, was amongst those named in the leaks. She says that she subsequently received numerous death threats online. Seretskova's case is not an isolated one, and the threats are not to be taken lightly. Last year, Oles Buzina, a Ukrainian journalist known for his pro-Russia stance, had his details leaked by Mirat Forets. Just 48 hours later, he was shot and killed outside his home in Kiev. And last month, the studio of Inter, the third most watched news channel in Ukraine, was set ablaze for what the perpetrators called a pro-Russia bias. The leaks revealed that Inter had been in communication with the separatists and had possibly amended its coverage in their favor. However, despite the fallout for journalists, Ukrainian opinion over the leaks remains divided. Many still maintain that Mirot Foritz has provided a useful insight into the media strategy of the separatists. Some of the most vocal supporters are Ukrainian government officials, many of whom say that the information war with Russia is ample justification for what they call patriotic journalism. It's a term that's been discussed a lot in circles and government circles and even some officials calling on journalists to be patriotic. What it means in practice, though, is always giving the government the benefit of the doubt. It has to do with the fact that the information war, especially at the beginning, was very one-sided, very pro-Russian, and very unfair to Ukraine. Now, the problem is that when uh, is the state is taking this too far, when this patriotic uh, journalism has gone too far, uh, there are some negative trends in Ukraine recently where certain journalists, a certain, um, uh, certain media outlets get fired because of um, apparently not overly positive covering of, say, the Ukrainian side. So it is true that Ukraine is kind of in the search for correct techniques to counter Russia's propaganda campaign. According to a study published by the US-based Institute for the Study of War, Russia has been using a, quote, advanced form of hybrid warfare in Ukraine that relies heavily on an element of information warfare and what the Russians call reflexive control. Reflexive control is creating an environment where your adversary reacts in a way that benefits your cause. According to the study, Moscow is using the media to create that environment. The role of the Russian media in the conflict in Ukraine cannot be overstated. Russian channels, they regularly publish made-up stories, and it is these stories that drive up hatred of, of Ukrainians towards their own, their own government. For instance, there is this notorious actress she famously told about a little boy who the Ukrainian army crucified in his underwear on a fence. The question is how, as an independent media, how do you report this information? now? If you do as traditional standards of journalism teach you to do, you'd first of all present this information uh, about this crucified boy, and uh, you will also present information from the Ukrainian side saying none of it has taken place. But it's very likely that most people who would have read this piece of yours, they would still believe like maybe the boy was not crucified, but there's no such thing as smoke without fire. And there are multiple other uh, cases like that. And it is these kind of stories that these journalists just make up and, and promote in Russian society and in the occupied regions. And of course, people who watch this, they, they begin to hate the Ukrainian army. They want Russia to come and liberate them. And so this is a, an element of the hybrid war that I think really is not understood in the West. <laughs> Because in a hybrid war, proving that such stories are wrong, that some have been simply made up, is not enough. Like the details of those journalists, they are already out there, creating an environment where the media have become a target. And when that happens, the real question becomes, who benefits?